Hello. Hey, thanks, Luke, you wonderful man. Such an honor to be here. How beautiful was the worship? Oh, I love this house. Thank you, uh, Pastor Dan and Pastor Brooke, for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're in this place and that we can come as we are. Whatever's happened during the week, whatever's happened in our lives, you just tell us, come as you are. Don't hide anything from your Father. And so, God, we come as we are to you, and we say, God, we want to know you, and we want to be known by you. Every part of us that we've hidden from you, we bring it before you today and say, Father, change us, renew us. Father, sanctify us. Amen. I'm going to preach a sermon today, which I entitled on Friday, Family, Fullness and the Future. I'm very excited about this message today. I was, when I was uh, a couple of years ago, my boy Pete, and I was at the dinner table. Anyone here love the Star Wars movies? Do we have anyone? Oh, whoa, a lot of people. I said to my son, Peter, there's something you need to know about your daddy. Your father has the force. And so we're at the dinner table, and I said, Pete, I'm going to aim the force at you. And I stuck my leg underneath the table on his chair, and I started aiming it, and I was just pushing his chair back slowly. He's like, Daddy, I'm moving. I know, my son, Daddy has the force. And then I balanced the pen on the table, and I said, watch this, Pete. And I'm aiming the force at the pen, and then I gave a little knock underneath, a little knock. And it fell, he's like, Daddy, it fell over. I know, my son, Daddy has the force. And then I said, Pete, now I'm going to aim the force at your mind. And I aimed the force at his mind. And I said, Petey, I'm going to make you think about a big gray elephant. And he's like, Daddy, I am thinking of a big gray elephant. I said, that's right, my son, Daddy has the force. But I want to tell you this, coming out of COVID, our glorious Father has thinking for His children that He wants us to come into and He wants to position these thoughts in our mind and change our thinking. And that's exactly what I want to share about today. I want to share about one of the most wild verses in the Scripture. It's not one of those common ones, so you may not have noticed it before, but I want to bring you one of my personal gems, and I think it's going to pull the Apostles' gems. But before I bring you this verse about family, fullness, and the future, I need to build you up so you can receive this verse boldly. I want to give you one of my treasures. Are you ready to receive my treasures? So I'm going to build you towards this. And so what I'm going to take is I'm going to take Romans 8, the greatest chapter in the Bible. And I'm going to take uh, Luke 15, the prodigal son story, perhaps the greatest story ever told. And we're going to bring those together. And then I'm going to load these up and I'm going to bring you this verse later on, okay? This treasure of mine, which I believe is for, uh, it's it's a scripture that God wants to reveal to the body of Christ across the world. So in Luke 15, Jesus tells the story of a son who took his father's inheritance and he squandered it with reckless living and he found himself, listen to this, surrounded by death. And everyone in this room, in some way or another, we have before God squandered what he's given us with reckless living. But our father's response to us is so beautiful in Scripture. Romans 8 contrasts the same death that comes from squandering your life with sinful living, what it means to come into being God's child and the life that surrounds you. It says this in Romans 8 verse 12, So then, brothers and sisters, we are dead as not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Listen, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. This is what happens to the son in the prodigal son story. The son who, who takes his father's inheritance and wastes it. He just finds himself surrounded by death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. And in this story, this is what the older brother does. But you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is quite a jam-packed passage, but this is what it's saying. If we pursue our own way and we reject God, we will end up surrounded by death. But if we will receive God and His love, we will be surrounded by life. We will become His children and He has an incredible inheritance for us. I said to my son, Pete, I was like, Pete, I've noticed when you pray, you call God Lord a lot. I want you to start calling God Father. And he said this to me. He said, Daddy, I don't want to have two daddies. I want you to be my daddy. And I was a bit hurt because I love spending time with God as my father. And I started to push him on it. And God said this to me, leave this one with me, Steve. Don't push him. Let me bring this one in. And so this is year one. This is two years ago. Later that year, we were in Cairns. Anyone here been to Cairns? Oh, how good is Cairns? Port Douglas? Yeah, Port Douglas? Oh, mate. It was so beautiful. One night, I'm with my daughter, and uh, Pete and Rosie are in bed, and I'm holding Charlotte like this, and I'm praying, and I'm walking around. She's about one, and God said to me, ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to her. And this is what the Scripture says. It says we're heirs in Christ. We're fellow heirs with Christ. Whatever Christ has been given through the victory of the cross, we have come into that. So I'm releasing these spiritual blessings boldly as a father over his daughter. This is what we're called to do, release heaven over earth. So I'm releasing over my daughter, and God shows me these two angels come down and bring these gifts before Charlotte. And then God said this to me. He said, seek me for another hour, and I'll show myself to you. So I'm in Port Douglas, we're on holidays, the next day is the AFL Grand Final, and I'm just seeking God, and I'm a little bit sleepy, I fall asleep, and I wake back up, I know God, you want me to see you for another hour, and I really want to look at some NBA scores, like I really want to look at these scores, but I'm not going to look at the scores, I'm going to seek you for an hour. So I seek God for an hour, I'm pretty sure I fell asleep a couple of times. And then I go into my wife's bedroom, and I'm ready to check out the NBA scores, and Rosie says this to me. I want us to repent for when we've stolen God's glory for what he's done in our family. And so we did a simple repentance. God, we're sorry for when we've stolen your glory in our family. That night, after I checked out the NBA scores, I went to sleep. And I had a dream from God of this. And it was a dream about the kingdom and revival and what God's doing. Two weeks later, there was a guy in my dream who I met. And now we're very close. That same night, Rosie had a dream, and an angel came down next to her with signs on the angel. And then there was next to her this, this uh, guy who used to persecute her in school for being a Christian. And she interpreted what was on the angel and called him straight into his fullness in Christ. The next morning, Rosie and I are discussing our dreams. Charlotte had this encounter. I saw these angels with Charlotte, my daughter. Rosie had this dream. I had this dream. And then Pete, my son, pipes up. And he says, last night, I went to heaven. We're like, Pete, you had a dream as well? He's like, no, 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 no. I was there, Daddy. We said, Pete, tell us everything. He said, last night, an angel came into my bedroom. And he had these weapons. He's describing the weapons. And the angel said this, you're going to have many more dreams like this. This year, Pete's had seven dreams from God. And this angel then takes Pete up to heaven. He's in the throne room on the holy room. He's sitting on God's lap. Now, remember I said to God, said, leave it to me about calling him father. I've got this one. And now Pete's sitting on God's lap. And he looks at him. And, and Pete said he was so bright. All I could see was light. And then God put his hand on my eyes. And then I could see his face. I could see him. And God spoke some very precious things to Pete while he was sitting on his lap. And that year, as a year one, Pete had read 10 children's Bibles, about three or 4,000 pages. And these angels came towards Pete. And he, Pete said this, on the left were all these warrior angels, like millions of them. And he described their weapons and they flew up and they went off. On the right were these praying and worshiping angels, millions upon millions worshiping. But the front were these playing angels and therefore playing for kids. And these playing angels came to Pete and they brought him a treasure box. 
And he opened the treasure box, and in the box was a psalm that was written just for Peter. And he opens the psalm, and a little boy who's year one, who'd been so faithful reading the Bible every day, reading his children's Bibles, is now reading face to face with God. A psalm that was written just for him. He was hungry, and God gave him a sandwich. Pete started describing. He said God was holy. He didn't use the word holy in his life. He said the bread was holy. He said the angels were holy. The room was holy. These playing angels then take him out, and he starts flying across outside the holy room, and he sees this river of life. He sees this tree of life with different fruits on it. He's describing John uh, in the book of Revelations. And we like, I open up and say, Pete, this is not in children's Bibles, but the detail you gave about heaven is just what John described in the book of Revelation. And he sees these different animals. After that, Peter had no problem calling God Father. And our God wants us to know what it's like to live in that holy room, seated in heavenly places as a father with his children. In verse 11 in Luke 15 of the prodigal son story, look at how Jesus in the story story illustrates how the glorious father wants to bring us into Abba Father, son, daughter relationship. In verse 20, it says, and he, the rebellious son, and we have all been there. We've all been rebellious to God. No one deserves to be God's child. It's only because of what Christ did on the cross. Jesus died on the cross so you, in all your rebellion, he could take that rebellion off you and completely cleanse you, just make you as clean as he is. So if you feel like, oh, Steve, this story is not for me. I can't be in this relationship with, with God the Father. I can't be there. doesn't matter. I don't deserve to be there either. The only reason why I stand boldly with my Father and look in his eyes like in this song is because he has washed me clean. And it's a beautiful gift. So the rebellious son, he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And the father sees you just as you are. And he felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. This is my first point. We live in the affections of sonship and daughtership every moment. You live in the running of the Father towards you. You live in the kissing, in the love. This is where you live. This is not a place where you come to Jesus. Yes, you come into that relationship, but this is where you live. If you will believe it, you can enjoy it every moment. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe And put it on him and bring a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Listen to me. Number two, we live dressed in the glory and the authority of sonship and daughtership. I'm bringing you this foundation for this beautiful gem I want to bring you later on. This is where we live. And then he said this, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. We live in the sacrificial love of the Father towards us. As a father, I know I am constantly sacrificing for my son and my daughter. There's this constant sacrificing for them. But our Father is constantly sacrificing for you. It's this constant sacrifice. He gave His Son and He gives His love and He pours out and He gives His pastors to serve you. He gives His children to serve you. You're constantly in the sacrificial love of being a son and daughter in Christ. And then He said this, and I love this. And let us eat and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He now declares over a son who said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He says, you are son, you are daughter. He declares it over you. When you come to Christ and say, God, I come as an unworthy sinner, he says, now I make you son and I make you daughter and I declare it over you and I clothe you in it and I cover you in my sacrificial love and I kiss you and I treat you like a child. This is the richness of sonship and daughtership. Now his oldest son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. I love this. So the older brother, the young, his the younger brothers come home. What does he hear in the house? Music and dancing. Who do you think was playing the instruments the loudest? It was the father. Who do you think was singing the loudest? 
Who was moving the most in the dance? It was the Father. And this is where we need to live in this place of his movements of singing and dancing around us. We are to live from this place in the field, right in this place where the sun drawn into the house of music and dancing and declaring of intimacy and love. This is where we pray from. Listen to me. We're not trying to get to this place. We rest into this place and we pray from here. We live from here. We serve others from here. We minister in the church from here. This is where you do your strategy for 2021. This is how you do your Saturday family day. This is how you preach. This is where you sing. This is where you worship from. We don't worship to get to the holy room. We rest into this place because of what Christ has done. This is where everything in the kingdom starts. From the glorious family of God. Nothing in the kingdom will come from outside resting into sonship and family with your glorious Father. There's no fruitfulness outside of this place. So rest into it, fully receive it, and let it pour out of your life. I don't beg God to come into my family room when it's family prayer times. There's no begging. Why? Because I believe what Jesus has promised in the Scripture Last night we had a family prayer time. We put on some Bethel kids. We put on some Hill song. We put on some elevation worship. And we just let the presence of God be manifest in our room. Listen to me. I don't ask and beg and seek God to come. We start from the place of where the prodigal son came in the holy room. We start from his affections are already in the room. His dancing and his singing is already in the room. Don't waste your life begging to get where Christ has already given his life to bring you. You don't stand where the angels stand before God. In Pete's dream, in his vision, the angels were there and there and there. But Christ didn't die on the cross to bring you to where the angels stand. He came to bring you where Christ stands with the Father. He have the right standing of Christ. So the Father is here and Christ and the Spirit are in this beautiful intimate dance. And when you come into the righteousness of Christ, when He washes you clean, you stand right where Christ stands with the Father and you stand there boldly. This is where you live forever, but you belong there now in your thinking and in your living. So I teach my family how to live from this place. I believe His promise that He's in the room. So we start from this place of glory we start from this place of my family is, is the Father's family, and then we start to worship. It's completely different. Yes, I have to discipline my son and train him and teach him and keep getting his attention and focus and help him in that place, but that's what I'm doing. I'm renewing his mind that God's already in the room, that it's through grace that we have great intimacy. Last school holidays, my son said to me, Daddy, tell me about a black hole. I said, Pete, I don't know what a black hole is. I can't teach you about a black hole. We're in the car. I said, but this, but ask God to teach you about a black hole. I've been asking God to show me this little bird somewhere. I just want to be walking along and see this particular native bird. And I've been asking for a couple of months, Pete. Just ask God. I'm believing God is going to show me this bird soon. And then he said to me, Daddy, how do I ask God? And I started talking about how to hear God's voice. I said, Pete, when you want to hear God's voice, it's like you listen to him, but then you hear, you feel like a loveliness or a goodness on some words that are in your heart. That's when God's speaking to you. When you're reading the Bible and you feel some loveliness or goodness on a verse, that's God's voice. He goes, yeah, I know what that is. So I said, let's do it right now while we're driving the car. So I started listening to God and God spoke to me this. He said, because you let me dance around your family, tonight when you speak at that youth camp, I'm going to dance around the youth. And I shared that to Pete, and I was a little bit teary as I was sharing it. And I said, Pete, did you feel anything? He said, yeah. He said, you know, Daddy, when you give me a kiss at night and you put your head into my neck, God didn't speak to me, but I kind of felt like he just put his head into my neck and just loved on me. I said, Pete, that's so beautiful. That's God just being Father, Son with you. And what's Pete doing? He's enjoying what Christ has done for him on the cross. But I tell you this, this is where we live every moment. 
So Pete's in that place, and I said, Pete, we're going to go have lunch with mum now. We met mum somewhere at a cafe. And I said, I want you to tell mum, because as you tell mum your story and you speak it to her, she can then have that same encounter with God. She can then sense God. So we, she tells the story, and I tell mum my story. And then we start kicking the footy at the cafe. At the cafe, the, the bird I'd been waiting for while we're kicking the footy, two of these birds come right next to us. And they're just there the whole time we're kicking the foot. It's like, Pete, see these little blue birds here? They're the ones I was asking God to show me. He chose right now to show me. Why? Because we're supposed to live in the Father's singing and dancing and affections. And then we're supposed to bring our families into it and our friends into it. This is how we bring them in. That night at that camp, I did the older call and everyone came forward and the Spirit of God just moved. But God said this to me, like I said, you let me dance around your family, I'll dance around where you minister. What's your home life like? Live in your home like you live in the Father's house and watch what He does at your workplace and in, with your friends. It starts there. The older brother says this in Luke 15. So what I shared about the younger brother, it's more about that's where we live from. The older brother is where we minister from. Now his older son was in the field and he came in, drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. Let that be the sound of your home, the father's music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. Listen to me. The older brother here, has that spirit of slavery and fear that Paul talked about in Romans 8. He wants to separate himself from the family, from his brother. But the father here entreats his son. Right now, our heavenly father is entreating his family out of COVID, come back together. Older son, don't judge the younger son. You are one in Christ. The same death and resurrection that broke the hostility between us, the death of Christ, it broke the judgment between us. When we rose in the resurrection, we actually rose as His children. We rose with Christ, the family of God. And so now we are seated with Christ, with our Father around His table. This is where the family of God lives. And the glorious family of God is made to bring the kingdom of God over our city. It's where we belong. And so the spirit of slavery and this orphan spirit of fear wants to separate you from the body, wants you out of this local church. But sonship says, this is where you belong because this is your family. So get here on church. If you don't go to church very often, come to church regularly. Get a hold of this wonderful church. This is where you belong. This is your family. You will live forever with them. And if you're like, oh, Steve, I kind of like, I'm like the prodigal son. who kind of ran away from God. Just come along and just let Jesus just wash you clean. The same Jesus that washed me clean, so I love being with my Father God, is the same Jesus that says to you, just receive me and I will cleanse you completely. Everything in the kingdom starts with the glorious family. It starts from this place with the father. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I have slaved for you, and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours comes home, who has devoured your property, listen, with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf, for him, it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus just washes you clean. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. And he says this to him. I love this. This verse I'm about to read you, uh, Dan did that verse about looking into the father's eyes. I boldly stand before my father, my hand on his head, his hand on my head, my forehead against his forehead, my cheek against his cheek. And I look at my father and he says this to me, this verse that he says to the older brother, he says, my son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. And I, and I boldly look at my father and I say, my father, I am always with you because of what Christ has done. Everything you have is mine. I want to steward it. My father, I am always with you because of what Christ has done. Everything you have is mine. I want to release it over this earth. 
boldly be who you are in Christ as a son. Because if we're heirs in Christ and everything Christ has inherited in the cross, if we won't boldly stand there, we won't release it. If we won't boldly be the family of God together, how will we release the heaven that Christ inherited and gave to His children upon this earth? So, I say this, son, daughter, this is who you are. Jesus has declared it. He's clothed you in it. He's intimacied you with it. He sacrificially loved you with it. My son, he says, you are always with me. You live in the celebration and the dancing and the singing of the Father every moment. And your family belongs there. And number three, all that is mine is yours. So, I now bring you to my verse, this treasure that I want to give to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is wrestling with the Corinthian church who have been living in their old sinful nature. They've been living as prodigal sons, still sinful, still seeing themselves as sinners, looking down on themselves, uh, disunity with each other, just sin. And Paul's wrestling with them to come into sonship. And then at the end of this great wrestle with them, when he's calling them into the kingship of sonship, he brings this verse, this treasure of of brilliance that I bring to you now. But do not listen to this verse as a slave. Listen to it as a son with your father, your hand on his head, his hand on your head, his eyes to your eyes. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 21 says, So let no one boast in men. Why? Because you didn't come into the Father's house. You didn't come into a singing and dancing because of what you did. You came in because of what Christ did. Christ died for you and He brought you into His resurrection. He brought you into the ascension. He poured His Spirit on you. He gave Him Himself. So let no one boast in men. But when you come into sonship, listen to this. For all things are yours. This is exactly what the father told the prodigal son's older brother. All that is mine is yours. If you will believe this, your life will explode with the kingdom of God. Everything that the father has belongs to you as his daughter. Not as a sinful person who's rebelled against God. But as his son and his daughter, which you are in Christ, if you have received him. This is what he goes on to say. Now he starts to unpack it. So, so he starts to unpack what it means that everything is yours. He says, Paul or Apollos or Cephas are yours. So he starts telling them that Paul the apostle, Cephas, which is Peter, and Apollos, who was like the Stephen Furtick preacher at the time, like Dan, like a real like Dan kind of preacher. He goes, these guys belong to you. So they had been saying, my identity is that, I'm a Bill Johnson kind of guy, or my identity is I'm a Steve Furtick kind of guy. No, Steve Furtick belongs to you and you belong to him. The Baptists belong to us and we belong to the Baptists. The Pentecostals belong to us and we belong to the Pentecostals. We actually belong to each other as one glorious family. Stop taking your identity from your leaders. Take your identity from sonship. And from sonship, you will be able to honor your leaders even more. Then he says this, I love this. So first he says, the family of God belongs to you. And it does, it's yours. What are you gonna do with it? Then he says this, the world belongs to you. And the word here is universe. Children of God, the universe belongs to you. It's yours. What are you gonna do with it? My family, we have 80 acres. But yesterday as we're walking along my 80 acres, I told my son, you know that everything belongs to you. The sky, everything is yours. And we're just discussing how everything is his. Why? Because if he grows up realizing the universe belongs to him, he'll steward it. Heaven belongs to us. The universe belongs to us. Let's release as God's sons our heaven onto our earth. We're not begging God to release it. We're taking what he's already given us and releasing it. And then he says this, or life or death. So now he's saying life belongs to you and death belongs to you. Listen to me. The resurrection life of Christ, the same power to raise Christ from the dead, 
is inside you and it belongs to you and it's yours as his child to steward. But he also says this, Paul, this remarkable man who transforms cities. He says, death belongs to you. All the poverty in Joondalup and Wanneroo and Perth and WA and the Philippines and Africa, it belongs to us. It's us. As God's children, everything is ours. What are we going to do about it? But he didn't just say, here's death and here's poverty. He said, here's life and here's the riches of heaven. So we release life into death. We release resurrection life of Christ into the death and poverty in our world. And then he keeps going. He gets bolder and bolder. And I tell you, if you will take this treasure as God's child, it will explode in your life and you'll see the kingdom of God come through your life. Let this change the way you think from. Think from face to face with the Father as His child, always with Him, and everything belongs to you. Let there be a largeness to your life. And then He says this, after saying life or death, and then He says, the present or the future. Listen to me. What's happening in the world right now in COVID belongs to you. The, the spirit of slavery across the world belongs to us. The, the orphan spirit. But what else has He given us? He's given to you the future. The person who dreams with the Father dreams and declares and releases the future onto earth. The new earth, when Christ returns, is going to be a renewed earth. And the family of God will be in complete oneness. We will be living in perfect unity as a family. That belongs to you now. So release the future into the present. If you believe it, you'll steward it. If you say that's a nice verse and you never take this treasure into you, you'll do nothing with it. But I believe this is the time where God's saying, I'm releasing these jewels and these treasures because I want a people, a whole generation, the older, the younger, not a separate generation, a whole family of God, the older, the younger, the middle, all together releasing as one family with the Trinity, heaven over earth. When I was a child, oh, sorry, let me finish that verse. Heaven, the the present, the future, All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. When I was a boy, our next-door neighbor died. And they, the family next door, they knew he was a chain smoker. They knew that my mum was a Christian. So they rang up my mum as the ambulance was coming. And she picked up the phone, and she took the call, and she said, I'll come over. And she said she felt like time stopped. And the four kids were all at the window watching, and mum walked across to this dead man, Norm, and God said to her, put your hand on her, and so, put your hand on him. So she went down, and she put his hand on him, and she said, Norm. And as she put his hand on him, Norm came up like this, his false teeth flung out of his mouth, and resurrection life went right into his body. Mum then visited him in hospital and led him to Jesus, and a couple of weeks later, he died. But when he died, listen to me, he didn't die to be forever separated from God. He died to live in that holy place. If you receive Christ, that's your forever. And it's just a receiving of a gift. So my wife calls me up when we're dating and I was in love with this girl. I was besotted. She calls me up and she says, I need to tell you something tomorrow and it could be the end of our relationship. I said, oh boy, put the phone down. I was like, what's going on? What have I done? I've been treating her so good. So I started praying and God said to me this, leave it with me, it's okay. The next day she comes over in my family, my parents' home, we're sitting on the front of the porch. And she says to me, the doctors have told me that I can't have babies and if I do, it's going to have to be through IVF. I said, and she goes, I know this could be the end of our relationship. Because I'm the kind of guy that needs kids. I got a lot of love. And, and I said, Rosie, don't worry about it. God told me last night not to worry about it. Now, I know this is a battle that a lot of families go through and they never see the victory. But I believe as the body of Christ rises together, we can take victory in this, in this area. But it's a battle we do together. And if you don't see the victory, you battle for others so they will see the victory. So there I am. And Rosie and I, and God says, God says I'm going to give you three kids. And we started pushing through in prayer. And that same resurrection life that my mum had declared and shown my family in our home, I had to bring it into my family now. I had to bring that life. And so we would pray. We would declare. Uh, four years we had, after being four years married, we had Peter naturally. Five years later, we had uh, Charlotte naturally. And now if you look at Rosie, two, three years later, we're about to have our third baby naturally. 
But we've done this time, not from a place of brokenness, but with our Father releasing heaven over earth. Why? Listen to me carefully right now. Death wanted to steal the future of my generations. Death comes to steal the future. But the future belongs to me. I'm God's son. I won't let it be taken from my family. So I boldly stand before my father and I rejoice with him. My father, I'm always with you and everything you have is mine, including this promise of resurrection life for my children. I receive it and I laugh and I started laughing with my father that he was gonna give me my children. It wasn't from a place of fear, it was a place of joy. And so now I have a son who, who has had, since, since his birthday in May, has had six, sorry, sorry, seven dreams from God. One of those dreams from God has gone across our whole city. The same time, Charlotte has been worshiping in a home in the glory of God. She said to me a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, she said, I'm just clean. I heard it's just clean. She was cleaning our prayer area. And I said, Charlotte, what are you doing? She says, I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning for Jesus. Can you come up, Dan? And we just host the glory of God in our family room. During COVID, we invited about uh, 40 pastors who lead pastors groups over to our home. So these are pastors who lead pastors groups. And we're in this place and I felt to do it. We had a bonfire and we were just going to share a couple of thoughts. But what happened is right in the middle of our family room, the Spirit of God started to move. The glory of God was in that room. And every leader in our city, these pastors who lead pastors groups, started sharing about how the family of God transforms cities. And it was like a movement around the room. And I sat back to Rosie. While this is happening, I said, Rosie, right where Charlotte spins as a two-year-old, where she spins and worships in the glory of God, there's now a conversation happening to transform our city between the leaders in our city. And the, one of the dreams that Pete had was about a tornado movement of God of the family of God. Spirit of God in a three-year-old and an eight-year-old can bring life to a city when a family lives face-to-face -face with their father and releases heaven over earth. God said to me, I'm pouring out my glory in your family. What are you going to do about it? And I say this to you as I finish. You're his child. You are always with Him. His affection, His clothing, His sonship drips off you. You are richly lavished in the grace of Christ. There's nothing more you can do to be close to the Father, to live in His glory. Christ has done it for you. But here's what you can do. You can rest into this richness and release it into your family, into your workplace, into this church. Let's pray. Can we stand up? I'll just close in prayer before we go to the baptisms. People, someone, Brooke said to me today, she looked at Pete, she said something like this, you are your father's son. She said that to my boy because he looks like me. Listen to me right now. You are your heavenly father's daughter. Your imprints are all over him. You are your father's son. There's nothing more that needs to happen to make you look like him. You are glorious. You are a holy one. You are loved. You are treasured. Father, I pray right now for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in this room. I pray for an impartation to steward being the glorious family of God, to steward the future, to steward everything, to steward this universe, to steward heaven upon earth. Father, I pray for a boldness in this room. Father, I release from heaven a boldness in this room, an increased vision for 2021, an increased vision for our future 
an increased vision that we are a family of God. Every part of us that has said, I am isolated and I'm separated, I break it in Jesus' name. You're part of the family of God. You belong to Him. You are one with the family of God. And now everything the family of God has been given in Christ belongs to us. Let's treasure it in Jesus' name. Amen.